This chapter is a brief introduction to chemical reactions, so it's kind of going to tie together some of the introductory materials we've gone over, like phase changes, um, dis making solutions, dissolving things, and then move on into chemical reactions. So we have talked about how atoms interact with each other. Um, we've talked about the different types of bonds, um, covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and we've discussed intermolecular forces. And so what we're going to try to start to get into now is interaction between completely different molecules. First of all, let's review the difference between a physical change and a chemical change. Um, dissolving and phase changes, those are physical changes. Um, the substance that you have in the beginning and the end of the process is of the same composition. Okay, so if you rip up a piece of paper, um, it's going to have a different form, little pieces instead of one big piece, but it's still going to be made of the same chemical composition, cellulose. Okay, so that's a physical change. Chemical change, you are always going to make a new substance, okay, and the composition of what it's made of is different. Um, chemical changes cannot be undone. Now, that's not to say some chemical reactions are reversible, but for example, you can't burn a piece of paper and then wave your hand over the ash and get the piece of paper back, okay? Physical change, on the other hand, can be undone. Uh, you can melt an ice cube and then you can freeze it back again and go back and forth. All right, so quick review on the difference. Um, chemical reactions are going on all around us, okay? Rusting, um, every time something burns inside your body, metabolism is a chemical change. Cooking, um, batteries, um, produce their energy through a chemical reaction, um, biodegradation. So they're just constantly all around us. It's pretty obvious that phase changes are physical changes. Um, and my picture did not uh, transfer over here for some reason. That's odd. Um, but for example, melting an ice cube, you can easily refreeze it and get the um, ice back. Um, same with boiling water. If you had some way to collect the water vapor, you could also recondense it and get your liquid water back. So all phase changes are physical changes. Are chemical reactions, which is what this chapter is going to focus on, although you maintain the total number and type of atoms, okay, so if you start with a sodium atom and a chlorine atom, you may uh, rearrange or the bonds between atoms may change, but you're going to end up with the same total number of sodium and chlorine atoms at the end. So what really changes in a chemical reaction are how the atoms are connected together, okay? So because you're changing how the atoms are connected, you are breaking bonds and making bonds in a chemical reaction. So what what is a bond? It's actually... Um, an attraction between valence electrons of two different atoms. So because it's the valence electrons, those are the electrons in the highest energy level, it's really important to understand how many valence electrons each element has. So if you've gotten a little shaky on that, you're gonna to wanna to review it. But if you look at a periodic table and the um, numbering the um, families or the groups, the vertical groups, um, if you look at the AB numbering system, um, 1A, they all have one valence, see? That's what the dot represents, the Lewis structure. Um, and 2A, they all have two valence electrons. The boron aluminum group, they all have three electrons. The carbon group all have four valence, okay? Nitrogen group has five. Oxygen group has six. Uh, halogen group has seven and the noble gases all have eight valence electrons. That's really important, okay? So make sure you're, you're real familiar with that. Um, eight valence electrons is considered a full outer shell. 
Uh, it is a stable condition for elements to exist in. And so um, I always say the elements are noble gases, want, noble gas wannabes. Okay, so all these other elements are really striving to get full outer shells of electrons. And so that's usually the driving force for chemical changes. All right, so again, just to kind of emphasize what I said, in a chemical reaction, okay, you're going to rearrange how the atoms are connected. So notice here, you have a carbon chemically bonded to four hydrogen atoms, and then you have molecular oxygen. Chemical reaction with this, this is a combustion reaction, by the way, anytime you have oxygen as one of the reactants and then some type of hydrocarbon as the fuel you're going to get carbon dioxide as one of the products and water as the other product. But I want you to look and see that the atoms are conserved. That's, that's law of conservation of mass. Um, you have four hydrogens on the reactant side. You have four hydrogens on the product side, one carbon on both sides, and two, no, four, one, two, three, four oxygens on both sides. So we've conserved the number and type of atoms, but they're connected completely different. Now, I have kind of a head-scratching question for you. Some people will argue that they believe dissolving is a chemical process. What do you think? Do you think dissolving is a physical process or a chemical process? So go back. That's a good little discussion question. So go back to maybe that table of requirements for chemical versus physical change and see what you think. I also want you to think about the different things that can dissolve. So what if we dissolve um, a covalently bonded substance? So we'll say glucose. Okay, there's its condensed chemical structure. Um, and it readily dissolves in water. It's covalently bonded, okay? And then let's compare that to an ionic compound. Let's look at just table salt. And let's dissolve that in water and think about what happens. And then the third thing I want you to think about, because we're going to be looking at these in chemical reactions, I want you to look at a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, which a lot of people don't realize this, but that's actually gas in its nature, natural state. So all the hydrochloric acid you deal with in the lab has been um, the gas dissolved in water. So they're all aqueous solutions. But um, so I want you to think about what happens to each of these three substances when they're dissolved in water. And ask yourself, are they all physical processes? Are some of them chemical? Um, and let me know what you think. Now, if you're really on top of your game, you would have been able to finish the equations I started on the last slide. Um, this is something you're gonna be expected to do, so if you need to brush up on, that's fine. I'm gonna go ahead and finish it for you here. So here is glucose, and when you put it in water, covalent compounds don't dissociate when dissolved in water, okay? So really, you just go from um, I think glucose is liquid normally. It's not table sugar, that's sucrose. But anyway, um, so everything stays intact, but when it's dissolved, you just describe it as aqueous. So, yeah, I mean, it's solvated. You have glucose molecules solvated by water molecules, but nothing has dissociated or changed much. So that's clearly, okay, so covalent compounds dissolving are clearly physical processes. Now, let's look at an ionic compound, table salt. Hopefully you know that every ionic compound, when it's dissolved, dissociates into the ions. And each of these ions are solvated individually. Now, is this a chemical process or is it a physical process? You'll get some people arguing I would argue that that is also a physical process because although it look, you know we've we've kind of separated these two atoms but we haven't rearranged how any atoms are bonded 
we haven't made a new substance that's going to stay because what would happen if you boil off the water? You'd get the sodium chloride right back. So I would argue you haven't made a new substance and that that still is a physical process. Now, strong acids, if you don't know this already, also dissociate. Even though they're covalent, they're the one exception that they do dissociate because the hydrogen ion, um, the bond between an acidic hydrogen ion is quite weak. And so you end up, it dissociates into a hydrogen ion if it's an acid. And then what's left over, okay? So again, I would argue the same thing that's still a physical process because you can, if you boil off the water, you're gonna get right back to where you were. Um, and assuming HCl is a gas in its normal state. Um, and uh, even though, again, you've kind of separated that, that bond, um, it's only temporary. So I would argue that all of these dissolution processes are physical processes. But every now and then in the literature, when you talk to somebody else, somebody will argue, um, but just so that you're aware. All right, let's go over what an electrolyte is. An electrolyte is simply a solution that conducts electricity. For some reason, students have trouble remembering this. Write it down someplace. It's very easy to remember and it's very important to remember, okay? So you'll hear references to strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, and non-electrolyte. What are they talking about? A strong electrolyte is a solution that conducts electricity very strongly, okay? I'll light your bulb way up. Weak electrolyte is kind of what you would intuit. Um, it does collect, conduct electricity, but with a weaker current. Non-electrolyte is something that does not conduct electricity, okay? So um, we're gonna talk about why that is, but I want you to look at the examples they've given under each of these figures. Ionic compounds that dissolve in water make strong electrolytes, okay? This is an acid, okay? Uh, it happens to be a weak acid. We'll talk about that more later. But it conducts electricity, but weakly. And then sugar, which is a covalent molecule, is a non-electrolyte. Can you look at those and tell me what you think the key is for a strong electrolyte? What does the sodium chloride solution have that a sugar solution doesn't have? Oh, yeah, just to add to the puzzle. Pure water does not conduct electricity. So a lot of people are like, don't step in water. If it's lightning, you're going to get electrocuted. Well, it turns out that if the water that was outside and all around us literally was pure water, H2O and nothing else, we wouldn't have to risk uh, it conducting electricity. However, there's a reason water is called the universal solvent, and that's because it dissolves almost everything in its path. Well, a lot of things, at least to a small degree. And so you virtually will never encounter pure water. Um, and so you just kind of have to assume that uh, water exists in solution all over the place and it probably will conduct electricity. Um, and then all ionic solutions conduct electricity. All ionic solutions that dissolve in water well, a solution implies it's dissolved in water, right? Um, our electrolytes, all of them, okay? So what is it about ionic compounds and acids that um, create an electrolyte, a solution that conducts electricity? So the bottom line is any solution that contains ions, any solution that contains ions is an electrolyte, okay? So we know that when we dissolve an ionic compound in water, it dissociates into the individual cation and anion. That's why it's an electrolyte. And as I mentioned briefly a couple slides ago, acids, also, when dissolved in water, dissociate into the hydrogen ion and 
the anion. And so it, the bottom line is any solution that contains ions is going to conduct electricity and is called an electrolyte. So summarizing, we'll say sugar or other covalently bonded. You guys remember what a covalent compound is, right? Something with two nonmetals. It's a covalent bond. Okay, so sugar is all covalently bonded, so it does not conduct electricity. No covalent um, compounds, with the exception of acids, uh, are electrolytes or conduct electricity. All ionic compounds, okay, that dissolve in water will conduct electricity and are electrolytes. Acids will also conduct electrolytes or conduct electricity. Um, strong acids will be strong electrolytes. Weak acids will be weak electrolytes. And that is it.